Welcome back! My name is Baller Scuba. This is Video Games Over Time. We are still in 1982, and today we're going to play Deadline. In our last video, we talked about Deadline, we gave the backstory to Deadline, but we also went through the casebook. And that casebook kind of gives us the scene of the crime, it gives us some interviews, it gives us quite a bit of information. So if you have not seen that video, I would suggest watching it, otherwise there might be some information that you're missing as we play through. Uh, I do also want to point out before we get started that this is a game that is complicated. There are a lot of clues in this game. Uh, we're going to ignore a lot of those clues because a lot of those clues will try to lead you to the wrong conclusion. Uh, we are on a time limit, so to speak, so we are going to try to get the proper ending, the good ending, so to speak, in this playthrough, which means that I'm going to not necessarily explore out and see what else is available. I'm going to try to build my case for the proper ending. If you were playing this game for the first time and you didn't have a guide, chances are it would take you multiple playthroughs of following clues and then finding out why they are wrong before you can come to the right conclusion. So with that said, let's get into the game. We have Deadline and Interlogic Mystery. Uh, this is release 27, which as we talked about in the last video was released in 1983, uh, but essentially it is going to be the same game as the one that came out in 1982. Uh, we do start on the South Lawn. You are on a wide lawn just north of the entrance to the Robner Estate. Directly north at the end of a pebbled path is the Robner House flanked to the northeast and northwest by a vast expanse of well-kept lawn. Beyond the house can be seen the lakefront. Uh, one of the first things I want to do, um, I believe it works in this game as well, I want to turn on verbose. I want them to give me as much detail as possible. It worked in Zork. It should work in Deadline as well. Okay, you will get verbose descriptions. Notice how the time didn't move. That's always nice. Okay, so let's go north. And now we're on the front path. You're at the Robner's front door, which is closed. You can walk around the house from here to the east or west. To the south, a rolling lawn leads to the entrance of the estate. Well, we need to figure out um, what happened to Mr. Robner, right? That, that's our victim, potentially. Uh, it was ruled a suicide initially, but this seems to be a murder mystery. I'm suspecting maybe a little bit more than just your normal suicide here. Maybe that's just me. Um, let's go and let's go ahead and knock on the door. Knock door, knock on door. It is Zork. I, I can't get away with that. All right. That's a lot. You hear footsteps inside the house. Mrs. Robner, dressed in black, opens the door and greets you. I don't remember all the voices I gave everybody before. Hello, she says. I'm Mrs. Robner. Please come in. I'm afraid I really can't help you much. This is surely a terrible waste of time, not to mention upsetting, having all these police marching around the house. This has been a trying time, as I suppose you can understand. As I told Mr. Coates and the other detective, you may look around, but you must be out by eight o'clock at the latest. Oh, I almost forgot. Mr. Coates will be reading my husband's will at noon in the living room. You may attend if you wish. Mrs. Robner leads you into the house and closes the door behind you. Now we're in the fo foyer. The foyer. This is the foyer of the uh, Robner house. Beautifully appointed with a fine crystal chandelier, marble floors, and a large marble top table. The front door to the south is closed. The foyer, foyer, I'm having a hard time saying that today. Foyer continues north. I'm going to make myself some breakfast now. I'll be around all day. I'm going to make myself some breakfast now, I should say in her voice. I'll be around all day if you need anything. I'll do what I can to help. Good day. Mrs. Robner heads off to the north. All right, so Mrs. Robner obviously is 
not as distressed as you would expect uh, for a, a grieving widow. Uh, but as we found out in the casebook, they weren't necessarily on the best of terms. Of course, the casebook, I would say, makes you want to think that the son had something to do with it. George was his name. Um, it, it seemed like there was something to hide there. We'll see if I continue to think that as we continue. But that's where I would say the casebook leads you to start. Um, but it seems so obvious that maybe... You know, you, you question that from the get-go. I know I do. All right, so we need to go to um, the the library. That is our goal. That's where Mr. Robner was found dead. So we will go up from here. Um, no, 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 no. We want to go north first. We have to get to the stairs. All right, this is north of Foyer. Foyer, the, uh, the foyer. I'm just going to say it that way. It's easier for me. Um, the foyer is basically just an entry way, in, in case you don't know. Uh, this is a hallway north of the foyer. To the west is an open doorway, and to the east is a foot is the foot of a staircase. The hall continues north. Mrs. Robner heads off to the north. Yeah, everybody's going to be moving as we continue, and there's only so much we're going to be able to pay attention to. We can't see everything because we're on a time limit here. Notice that every time I move, uh, we do waste a minute, so to speak. So we have some time, and uh, as long as we ignore all the false clues, we should have plenty of time to solve the case. All right, so from here, we want to head east. To the bottom of the stairs. You're at the foot of the stairs to the second floor. Open archways lead west and south. Then we want to go up. We want to get to the library and those are up the stairs as we found out in the case book. Stairs. You are on a landing halfway up the flight of stairs. You notice that the stairs do indeed make quite a noise when stepped upon. That is referring to the case book when uh, the... I want to say the maid... Said it? The housekeeper, I believe they called her. Mrs. Rourke was her name. She said that there was no way anybody could get up the stairs without somebody hearing it. Top of the stairs. You're at the top of the staircase where short hallways run north and south. In a corridor the length of the house, the house heads west. Uh, we want to follow it west. Uh, we're going to go all the way to the end of the hallway here. Hallway, you are just west of the staircase. There are doors on both sides, north and south of the hallway, which continues west. Both doors are closed. We'll continue west. This is approximately the middle of the corridor, a convenient place for a closet full of linens. Stairs to the east and a window to the west are about equidistant. The closet to the north is open and rather shallow. West again. This section of the hallway is near the west end. Through the window at the end of the hall, you can see some trees in the lake beyond. The hallway continues east and west, and a door to the south is closed. West one more time, and we've made it to the end of the hallway. This is the west end of the, the upstairs hall. To the north is the library, where Mr. Robner was found. Its solid oak door has been knocked down and is lying just inside the entrance to the library. A window which cannot be opened is at the end of the hallway. Uh, apparently there's nothing to the south, or at least uh, to the south is not important. So we have the library. As we were told, the police came and chopped down the, or the, the door with some axes in order to get inside because it was locked from the inside. So that's why it's destroyed. It's not uh, proof of any forced entry or anything like that. We have to keep our detective mindset going this entire time. Uh, let's head into the library. This is the library where Mr. Robner's body was found. It is decorated in a simple but comfortable style. Mr. Robner obviously spent a great deal of time here. A wide executive desk sits before tall balcony windows which lie at the north of the room. A telephone is sitting on the desk. To the east, the east side of the room is composed of three large bookshelf units containing numerous volumes on many topics. The floor is carpeted from wall to wall. The massive oak door which blocked the entrance has been forcibly knocked off its hinges and is lying by the doorway. A pencil is lying on the floor near the desk. Beside the desk is a large collapsible tray. Sitting on the tray is a bowl containing a white powdery substance. 
Alongside the desk is a wicker waste paper basket. The waste paper basket contains a bunch of crumpled papers. Lying on the floor, overturned, is a beautiful saucer. Turned on its side, lying on the floor, is a beautiful teacup. Lying atop the desk is a pad of white note paper. A desk calendar is here, open to July 7th. There is a bottle of a bully in here. So, obviously, the crime scene's going to be important. This is where he died. Uh, they say that he overdosed on a bully and just... Uh, took a whole bunch of it, drank his tea, and collapsed. Uh, they said sometime around 1 a.m., if you're to believe the coroner. So, there's a lot of false clues here. Uh, the only thing that we are going to take uh, right now is the note paper and the calendar. Those are the only things that we are going to need to look at. Uh, you can take a look at the ebullion, obviously. The white powdery substance stands out as something that probably could be a clue, but it's going to lead us down the wrong path. So these are the things that we're going to take. All right, we got the notepad. We got the calendar. Uh, we're going to uh, carefully examine the pad, the notepad. You do have to say carefully if you just say examine it, it's not gonna give you enough information. So carefully examine the pad. We're gonna, you know, kind of skip ahead. I could just examine it and then carefully examine it, but we'll just skip that and go to carefully. There are some indentations on the paper. Something may have been written on the previous sheet. So right, there, there's some indentations of some writing right? Because he pressed hard on the previous sheet, so we might be able to make that out. So let's hold the pad up to the light and see if we can make it out. We sure can. Well, we can make out some of it. Looking at the pad against the light reveals impressions left by writing on the previous sheet. The writer must bore down heavily, but only a few words come out clearly. It must have borne down heavily, but only a few words come out clearly. So it starts with Baxter. Baxter is his business partner. So already we've got a clue. We should probably talk to Baxter about this at some point, but he's probably not here right now. Baxter. St time. Insist. Up. Merge. Emnity. Auth, of, possibly, <laughs> force, document, e, pis, plica, e, focus, is, recons, late, ursha. Okay, so uh, it's kind of hard to make out what's going on here, but we can see uh, Baxter. Um, maybe it says this will be the last time. Um, first time maybe, but my, my guess is last time because they've been talking about this for a while according to the interview. Um, insist, I'm going to say that says oppose the merger. That's what it sounds like to me. Oppose merger. Um, force, and then something about documents. That's what that document is. Document, um, somebody possess, maybe there's a replica and I don't know what recons is. Well, I know what recons are, but I, I, I just assume that's different. I don't think they're reconciliations, but maybe that's just me being a, an accountant by trade. All right, so we got some information. It seems to be pointing to Baxter right now that there was something that he wrote re recently to Baxter that we're probably going to have to ask him about. All right, so let's uh, turn the calendar and see what Mr. Robner had on his calendar uh, for the day after he died, the morning after he died. I mean, he died at 1 a.m., so technically day of he died, but morning after. It is open to July 8th. There is only one notation here. In the 9 a.m. spot, call Coates will completed. So Coates is his lawyer, right? And he has completed a will. But we don't know 
what that will says because when we got the letter from Coates from Mr. Coates, he did he mentioned that there was a change in a will a couple weeks ago, but nothing recent to the point that he's going to have to call him and tell him about it now. So those are the clues that we have. Those are the clues that we're going to work with. Um, we are ready to go. Um, so we don't need anything else for the time being. So let's head south uh, to the end of the hallway. We'll go east and kind of head all the way back to the top of the stairs. Uh, then we will go down, down, um, I believe it was west from here to the right to the foyer, foyer, uh, south, and then we'll go uh, south again. Nothing new for all of that. Front door is closed. Open front door uh, south. Okay. So it's 828 right now. Uh, we kind of want to wait around. Like I said, uh, we're, we're not necessarily exploring. We're just kind of trying to do what we need to get our case together. So we have plenty of time. As long as we do that, we want to wait until 10 a.m. Okay, you sound, you hear a faint ringing sound coming from the house. Uh, do you want to keep waiting? I do. We're going to ignore that. I believe it is a phone call. A car pulls up to up the drive to the south, and Mr. Baxter steps out onto the lawn. Um, yes. Uh, we're, we're going to... That, that is one of the things that we were waiting for, was Mr. Baxter. Uh, there was supposed to be something else um, that happened. But uh, we will, we'll just move on as if that, well, we'll just have to skip that part for now. Um, Mr. Baxter has arrived, and so what we want to do is show the pad to, um, to Baxter. We can just call him Baxter. I don't have to say Mr. Baxter. Mr. McNabb? What do you mean he's not, Mr. Baxter's not here? You just said he was here, and then now to the east, Mr. McNabb comes into view from the northwest. We don't know Mr. McNabb. That's new to us. Um, wait for Baxter. Can I just do that? Okay, there we go. So we had to wait for him to get all the way up the, the lawn. Apparently that took him about 10 minutes. Uh, Mr. Baxter is walking past you. Mr. Baxter, for whom you are waiting, has arrived. It is now 10.04 a.m. Show pad to Baxter. He reads it carefully against the light, then speaks. I really don't know what to make of this. Mar Marshall seems to, ins to be insisting that I do something. I'm afraid we will never know, since I never got the note. Okay. So we have something. Um, that, that's not in, entirely what I was hoping to get from him, but, uh, we're just going to keep waiting. All right, here we go. Mr. Baxter starts to move about distractedly. A mailman walks briskly up to you, hands you an envelope, and departs. Do you want to keep waiting? No. Mailman's a little bit later than I'm used to, which is throwing me off, uh, but that, that's fine. Uh, let's open envelope. Opening the handwritten envelope reveals a letter. Mr. Baxter heads off to the north. All right, so then we will read the letter. This is from Stephen. So I'll give it my voice, apparently. Dear Leslie, I am sorry to learn that Marshall has been despondent again. His obsessive interest in business must be causing you terrible anguish. It doesn't surprise me that he talks of suicide when he's in this state. But the thought of the business going to Baxter after he's gone will keep him alive. So George has finally gone too far? It's hard to believe, after all those empty threats, that Marshall actually followed through. It serves that little leech right, if you ask me. This means that, should the unthinkable happen, you will be provided... You will be provided for as you deserve. I'll see you Friday as usual. Love, Stephen. So, Leslie is the wife 
Leslie Robner. Marshall is her husband, Marshall Robner. George is the son. And once again, we have um, kind of a, a, a hint here. They're trying to point us at George. It seems like we've had a two people now, one in the interview and one in this letter, kind of hinting that George might be the one that did it. Um, but the only physical evidence that we have is actually pointing to Mr. Baxter. Okay, so let's go ahead and wait until 11 a.m. again. It's now 11 a.m., All right, uh, what we need to do is just wait one at a time here. 1103, 1106, 1109. Okay, Mr. McNabb off to the east disappears from sight to the northwest. I think we are good. Uh, we are going to keep waiting. There we go. The local paper boy in an amazing athletic feat throws a newspaper toward the house from a distance of at least 100 feet. It even lands beside the front door rather than in the bushes. Do you want to keep waiting? No, I was looking for that. Okay, so we're going to read newspaper. I think I can just read it. I don't have to take it first. I can't. I did take it as well. The Daily Herald is a local paper in two sections. In your cursory look at the first, you find a brief obituary for Mr. Robner. It details his career, including the formation of Robner Corporation. A few years ago, Mr. Robner and the Robner Corporation were given a prestigious award for works in the community. At that time, Robner said, I am proud to accept this award for the corporation. Robner Corporation is my whole life, and I will continue to guide it for the public interest as long as I live. Robner himself had won great public acclaim for his charitable works. Now, let's take a look at the second section. We saw the first section. What does the second section say? In your study of the second section, a small item in the financial section catches your eye. A merger between Robner Corporation and Omnidyne is set to be concluded shortly. There is a picture of Mr. Baxter with Omnidyne President Starkwell, both smiling broadly. Baxter is quoted as saying that the deal will enable the financially ailing Robner Corporation to continue to produce the highest quality products. The article points out that Marshall Robner, who founded Robner Corporation, but is no longer its major stockholder, had been found dead yesterday morning, an apparent suicide victim. Baxter is quoted as saying that Robner was in full agreement with the terms of the merger. Okay, so we have a note saying that uh, he opposes the merger, at least that's my interpretation of what it said. And now we have a newspaper that's saying that Baxter says that Robner was fully on board with it. But we do have... I would say the starts of a motive here. Okay, so let's head north to the foyer. North again to the north of foyer. This time we're going to head west into the living room. This is a large and impressive room whose furnishings bespeak the great personal wealth of the Robners. The south side of the room is a large bay window, now closed, which looks out onto the front yard. A wood pile sits beside a huge fieldstone fireplace. A double doorway leads, leading to the main hall is the only exit. Pictures of Mrs. Robner's colonial ancestors line one wall. Oh, that's fun. Uh, the room contains formal seating for at least 15 people in several groups of chairs and couches. Tables and cabinets, all of the finest mahogany and walnut, complete the furnishings. On one of the tables is a telephone. Mrs. Robner is sitting here knitting. Mr. Baxter is sitting here reading a book. Doesn't seem like these people are too distressed about what's happened. <laughs> like, at all. Um, what we want to do is uh, wait for George. George is going to be coming pretty soon, so. Uh, yes. This is... Ms. Dunbar steps into the room. We're still waiting. Uh, we're still waiting for George. Mr. Coates steps into the room. Mr. Coates shakes your hand. I'm glad you're here, Inspector. We'll begin the reading soon. 
Um, like, yeah, I'm getting things a little bit out of order than I'm used to. Usually George shows up before Mr. Coates. Um, yes. Yes. George steps into the room. George, for whom you are waiting, has arrived. It is now 12.03 p.m. So George is a little bit late. That's understandable considering his character so far. Uh, we want to show the calendar to George, right? Because George would be the one that possibly is disinherited from the will. So what do you have to say about the fact that your father recently wrote a new will? And there was talk of you being disinherited in it. Oh, wow. Okay. George tilts his head in thought, or perhaps surprise, but recovers quickly. All I know is that Coates is my father's personal attorney. Ah, uh, Mr. Coates says, everyone's here now. <laughs> Mr. Coates begins. This is an awkward situation. Mr. Robner told me five days ago that he wanted to execute a new will and promised to call me when it was completed. As I never heard from him, I must assume that he either changed his mind or did not complete the new will. Therefore, the one in my possession must be considered the most recent testament. You notice that George, who was not initially paying close attention, now perks up and begins to look about anxiously. Continuing, Mr. Coates says, Naturally, should a more recent will exist and be found within a reasonable period, the present one will be voided. I will proceed with reading the will here in my hands, which was executed three years ago last month. He reads the will, simply written and direct, leaving equal parts of the estate to his son, George Arthur Robner, and his wife, Mrs. Leslie Phillips Robner. There is some discussion, understated congratulations, and overstated sympathy, which Mr. Coates cuts short by clearing his throat. I must leave now, I'm afraid. If you have any questions, I can be contacted tomorrow. He picks up the phone, dials his office, and asks to be picked up at the Robner estate. George, now looking quite upset, starts for the door. I've, I've got to be going now. I'll see you later, George says. He starts to, where am I now? <laughs> oh, right at the end. He starts to leave. George heads off to the east. Mr. Coates heads off to the east. Okay, so uh, we have the will, um, but it sounds like there might be another will out there. So that's what we're going to try to work on next. Um, I have to get up. I'm on the sofa um, right now. You're already standing up. All right, so I was already standing up. Uh, let's head east to the north of the foyer. Uh, George steps onto the stairs. Mr. Coates off to the south, disappears from sight to the south. We'll head east again um, to the bottom of the stairs. George off to the east, disappears from sight up the stairs. So George seems to think that there's something else going on here. Um, we should probably follow him. Up, up. All right, George is to the west, heading off to the west. Wasn't he to the east before? Interesting. Okay, we'll head west. George glances back at you briefly, then continues on his way. George is to the west, heading to the west. So we'll follow him. Uh, George off to the west, ducks into the room to the south. Okay, so we want to go west one more time here. You hear George door. George's door closed. Uh, so we found him. He's in his room, we're going to assume, to the south. But I have questions for him uh, because he is not necessarily helping me out all that well. Um, unfortunately, he's not really going to let us in right away. Uh, so we're going to continue west. Uh, no, we're at the end of the hallway. And we're going to... Uh, go north into the library. There's all that stuff still there. We're still ignoring that. Uh, then we want to open up the uh, balcony door. Balcony door is now open. Let's go north to get out to the balcony, the library balcony. The balcony is bare of furniture, though it has a beautiful view of the rose garden. The North Lawn and the Lake. 
A metal railing around the balcony prevents an accidental drop from to the thorny bushes below. The window between the balcony and the library is open. So um, we want to wait here. Didn't take long. You see George through the doorway, looking down the hallway, then darting into the library. We're going to keep waiting. Yeah, there's some important stuff here. George walks purposefully toward the bookshelves. He looks around, but you react before he can see you. When you peek out again, George is fiddling with the shelves. His right arm reaches into the shelf, and to your amazement, the unit of bookshelves on the left rotates away from the wall, revealing a darkened room behind. George enters it, trembling with barely controlled fear and excitement. I think we found something here. We're, we're going to stop waiting. It's only 12.18. We still have, you know, about eight hours to go. Uh, but George is looking like a likely suspect at this point. Uh, let's go south. Okay, we still have a lot of the same stuff. Uh, the new stuff is after the ebullion, so... A dim light in the hidden closet comes on. In the faint light, you can see George motioning with his right hand. All at once, the shelf swings shut. Apparently, that was all the new stuff that we had. Okay, so we want to carefully examine the bookshelves. The shelves contain many books and manuscripts covering a wide range of subjects. They are meticulously arranged. One book is out of place, however, leaving a gap in one row. On closer inspection, a small black button can be seen at the back of this gap. Well, that sounds interesting. Um, we're going to wait twice. It's now 1230 exactly. Press button. The leftmost shelf quietly swings out against the balcony window. As the shelf swings open, George spins to face you. His expression, first seemingly wild with happiness, changes to one of panic and horror. He jumps around, trying feebly to conceal a piece of paper in his hands. He jumps towards you, then recoils in fear. Finally sobbing, he crumples the, to the floor, clutching the paper beneath him. A large combination safe embedded in a wall is lying open. You enter the hidden closet. In the hidden closet. This is a secret room situated between the library and the master bedroom. The room is bare and somewhat dusty, as if it were not often used. An unmarked switch plate surrounds two buttons, one blue and one red. A formidable safe is embedded in the south wall. The heavy safe door is wide open. The library can be seen through a door to the west. George is here. George is holding a new will. Apparently I can make that out from here. So uh, we're going to take the will. And then we're going to examine the safe. A stack of papers bound together is in the safe. We're going to take that stack of papers. Let's read those papers. Leafing through these papers, it becomes obvious that they incriminate Mr. Baxter in wrongdoings regarding the focus scandal. They document funds which were embezzled by Baxter and tell how the scandal was hushed up. This evidence would be sufficient to convict Mr. Baxter in the focus case. If you remember, one of those things in uh, that we were able to make out was the word focus. This is what that's talking about. So apparently Mr. Baxter was doing some wrongdoing. Uh, it does sound like, well, embezzlement means he was uh, taking money. All right, so. Um, let's uh, let's read the will, because I think I have time to do that. Um, let's try that. This is Mr. Robner's new will, disowning George and giving his entire estate to his wife. No real surprises there. Okay, so let's head west, which will take us back out to the library. Uh, from there... Oh, what does it say that's new? The bookshelf unit on the far left has been swung open, revealing a room behind it. And it looks like that's all that's new here. Uh, let's go south, and then we will head east four times to get back to the staircase. Uh, to the west, George enters the hallway from the north. So he has recovered, I guess. Uh, let's head down 
down, uh, west, and south. Um, the door is open so I can head outside, which is what I want, to the front path. All right, nothing new here. I had to do, I had to read that for a little bit. So from the front path area, we're going to go east to the east of front door. You're in the front of the Robner house, just east of the front door. A small window closed and securely locked is the only thing of note here. To the northeast is the east side of the house. The ornately carved cornerstone of the house is nearby. Oh, this is an old house if they have a cornerstone. Uh, that's That's old like mason stuff. Um, northeast, east side of house. There are no windows or entries of any kind here at the east side of the house. To the north is the orchard and the front lawn lies to the south. A lawn also slopes down toward the shore of a lake to the east. Okay. Um, let's go east. To the east lawn, you're on a neatly manicured lawn east of the house, which extends north and east to the shore of a lake. To the northwest is a peaceful orchard, and toward the south, another wide lawn. Southeast beside the lake is a small shed with a solitary dirty window. Mr. McNabb is off to the northwest. Mr. McNabb is the one that we're hoping to talk to, I guess. That's one way to put it. Um... Let's head northwest on the orchard path. You're on a path at the edge of a small orchard of fruit trees, which abuts the eastern side of the back of the house. The orchard is obviously intended more to display the beauty of the blossoms in spring than to produce significant amounts of fruit. I, I don't know enough about fruit trees to be able to tell the difference, but I'm going to take your word on that. The windows of the kitchen look out onto the orchard although your view of them is blocked by the trees and a small grape arbor. To the west is a path along a rose garden and lawns sweep out to the e north and east. There is a wooden ladder here. Mr. McNabb is here pruning the trees. He seems quite worked up and is talking aloud to himself. All right, I'm going to take the ladder first. Um, then we are going to listen to McNabb. You can't make out everything. But he seems to be complaining about weeks of work on the roses ruined by someone stomping around in the garden. There are references to elephants and holes. When he's worked up as now, he doesn't always make much sense. Okay, so uh, we're going to actually talk to McNabb. We're actually going to use words, uh, which is something we haven't done yet. You can do all of this throughout the game, but this is the first time that it came up. McNabb, show me holes. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, you can also say, uh, say to McNabb, and then put the, it in quotes. There's other ways to do it, but this is the easiest way. McNabb, show me holes. Follow me, he says, and starts walking toward the roses. Mr. McNabb heads off to the north. Okay, so let's head north and follow him to the north lawn. This idyllic spot lies on a jut of land well north of the house and is surrounded on three sides by lake shore. Its charm includes the sweet smell of roses blown on a southwest breeze from the rose garden and by the sound of the leaves rustling in the orchard to the southeast. Head, and then Mr. McNabb heads off to the south, so we're going to follow him. Now we're on the garden path. You are at the edge of a large rose garden meticulously maintained by the gardener, Mr. McNabb. He is said to be exceedingly proud of this particular garden, which is the envy of the, of the neighbors. Rows of roses are neatly arranged on the sweet fragrance of the flowers. Is worth a trip here in itself. Rows of roses are neatly arranged in this. Oh, and the sweet fragrance of the flowers is worth a trip here in itself. An orchard to the east contains many varieties of fruit trees and wide lawns lie to the west and north. The roses themselves are to the south, filling the area between you and the back of the house. Mr. McNabb heads off to the south. Every once in a while they throw a, a sentence out there and I read it uh, wrong because I didn't look far enough ahead. All right, we are among the roses. You are among rows of roses. The ground is soft 
and your footsteps leave a rather bad impression as many poor seedlings are trampled underfoot. Is he going to be mad at me now? A safer place to admire the flowers lies to the north. A window to the south allows a view into the house. There is no way into the house from here. McNabb grabs your arm and leads you to a spot deep within the garden and near the house. You might never have found this place alone. He points at the ground where you see two holes in the soft earth. Mr. McNabb heads off to the north. Okay, so we have found the holes. And like they said, we needed him to show us. So we're going to search the ground here. You are making quite a mess, but you do run across some tiny pieces of a hard, shiny substance, which drop from your fingers and back onto the ground. Um, am I... Because I know what it is, I'm trying to figure out if I can just say that already. Um clean uh, pieces. Can I just do that? Word pieces in any of that. Okay, so it's porcelain. I'm just going to say that. It's porcelain. Can I do that? I can't see any porcelain here. All right, I think the issue is that I didn't actually find what I'm looking for, even though it's very clear that I thought I did. Um, we need to dig around holes. There we go. Ouch! You cut your finger on a sharp edge as you dig. You search carefully in the dirt now that you are sure something is there and pull up a piece of porcelain covered with dirt and dried mud. Uh, McNabb comes over to you and takes the ladder. He walks off towards the orchard. <laughs> hey, I was going to use that. Like, I needed that, like, pretty soon here. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to go get that back. Uh, clean the porcelain. As you wipe off the pieces of porcelain, you notice that it is a fragment of some very beautiful piece, handsomely painted. All right, well, that's something. Let's analyze the porcelain. Sergeant Duffy walks up as quietly as a mouse. He takes the fragment from you. I'll return soon with the results, he says, and leaves as silently as he entered. Uh, all right, so... I'm going to need to go back to the orchard. That's not fun. Let's go find, okay, the garden path. Uh, where is the orchard? I think it's north some more. That's the north lawn. He's off to the southeast. Okay, there's the orchard path. Uh, I'm going to take that ladder. And then I'm going to head west from here at the garden path, then said south. Okay, so now I'm among the roses again. This is what I needed. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, put ladder in holes. There we go. The ladder fix perfectly in the holes. You slowly release the ladder and it re rests on the railing of the balcony above. There we go. So, um, examine balcony railing. Can I do that from here? Or do I have to climb the ladder first? Okay. Up. Oh, there we go. Library balcony. Um, the window is open. The top of the ladder is resting on the metal railing. Okay, now I can examine balcony railing. Examine railing. There we go. Apparently I was too specific. There's a few times that happens. The railing is made of a sturdy metal and prevents nasty f and helps prevent nasty falls. There's a small area of paint scraped off the outside edge. Interesting. So, uh, we're going to go down because I don't like hanging out on the ladder. And we are going to wait for Duffy. Sergeant Duffy returns with the fragment. For a moment, you muse on his almost m magical entrances. The fragment, he begins, contains traces of tea and sugar. In addition, there seems to be some other chemical present that is not a common medication. It could take weeks to determine exactly what it is. It is definitely not amitraxin, a bullion, though. There are no clear fingerprints. 
With that, he leaves, handing you the fragment as he whisks away. It is now 1.29 p.m. Okay, so we got the information that we need. There was um, tea in there. There was sugar in there. And there was some other drug other than a bullion, uh, which is what we thought that he overdosed on. So we have a little bit more information for us. Let's head south. You can't enter the house here. Oh, right, we need to go up. We were supposed to wait at the balcony. Uh, south. South. I don't like waiting on top of a ladder for somebody to give me analysis. Maybe that's just me. All right, let's head south again. And then we will go east all the way to the top of the stairs. And then... Where do we want to go from here? Uh, we want to head, can I just go south? I can. South from here to the south upstairs hall. That is a new spot for us. The hallway turns a corner here and continues east to the north is the head of the, is the, head of the stairs. The door to the south is open. South again. Dunbar's bathroom. This bathroom contains the usual sink, toilet, and bath. A medicine cabinet closed is above the sink. The door to the north is open. Let's open the medicine cabinet. What, what's going on in here? Opening the cabinet reveals a bottle of low blow, a bottle of cough medicine, and a bottle of aspirin. So what's this low blow that you're, that you're talking about? Let's examine that. Okay. It's from the FroBiz Pharmacy. Call back to Zork. Uh, number 69105, Ms. S. Dunbar. Low blow. Take one tablet three times daily. Fismo Labs Limited, Kingston, Ontario. Low blow brand of methsparin USP 10 milligram tablets. Warning, low blow may be dangerous when used in combination with other medications. Please read the enclosed circular prior to using these tablets. Um, so let's see if we can't figure this out. So there's a combination that might be a problem, huh? Analyze the porcelain for low blow. Sergeant Duffy walks up as quietly as a mouse. He takes the fragment from you. I'll return soon with the results, he says, and leaves as silently as he entered. Yeah, we just kind of have a magical sergeant that can show up and give me what I need. It's fun. Um, so if you remember for if you remember what he said, um, we're just going to uh, wait for Duffy again, I think. Sergeant Duffy seems to arrive from nowhere, holding the fragment in his hands. This fragment did contain low blow. Here's the full report. He hands you a slip of paper and parts. Okay, so we'll read a paper. Which paper do you mean? Uh, read lab report. All right, dear inspector, in response to your request for analysis of the ceramic fragment, we have found evidence of a drug called methsparin, which is usually sold in this country under the name low blow. It is a blood pressure lowering agent used primarily in Europe, which explains the oversight in our blood analysis of the deceased. A double check reveals a high blood level of methsparin. While the amount of methsparin in the blood isn't dangerous in itself, a strong reaction between it and various other drugs has been well documented. As you may have gathered, one of those drugs is amitraxin, ebullion. The effect of methsparin is to displace amitraxin from protein binding, leaving more free in the blood and simulating an overdose. Your new evidence leads me to conclude that the cause of death was amitraxin toxicity secondary to ingestion of methsparin and amitraxin in combination. Sincerely, Arthur Chatworth, pathologist. All right, so if you remember, Ms. Dunbar is the one that gave uh, Mr. Robner the tea. So for her to have this medication, which causes meth, um, the amitraxin not to be absorbed and to cause an overdose is a big problem. Well, it simulates an overdose, but I mean, the effect is the same. He died from it. Okay. So what we need to do is try to figure out where Ms. Dunbar is. Um, so let's go north twice, and then we will, oh, Mrs. Robner enters the hallway from the north. That's all right. We're ignoring her. West uh, to doors on 
you know, both sides, and Mrs. Robner heads off to the east. Um, I believe that she is going to be here to the south. This is Dunbar's bedroom. This is Ms. Dunbar's room. It is furnished in the usual style with a few additions indicative of Ms. Dunbar's taste. The bedroom door is open. Ms. Dunbar is lying on her bed. We have some questions for you. Let's show the lab report to Dunbar here. She seems stunned, but recovers quickly. He didn't commit suicide then? She says, but low blow, that's a pill I take for my blood pressure. She pauses. I can tell what you're thinking, but I didn't, couldn't have done it. Why should I? Someone must have taken them. Maybe George, he knew I used them. People keep on trying to throw George under the bus. It doesn't seem like that's the likely thing at this point. It looks like to me that it is um, Mr. Baxter. That's my thought at this point. But we have something. Um, so we're going to wait a few times. Wait. All right, Ms. Dunbar heads off to the north. We're going to stop waiting. She's done with her nap as I stared at her awkwardly until she got up. <laughs> Sometimes I'm creepy. It happens. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to follow her. Once again, sometimes I'm creepy. I'm a detective, it's allowed. <laughs> follow her to the east, follow her down the stairs, keep following her down the stairs, follow her to the west, uh, keep following her to the west. Now we're in the living room. Um, I believe everything is the same except Ms. Dunbar is sitting on the sofa, Mrs. Robner is sitting here knitting, Mrs. Rourke is dusting the room, that's the first time we've seen her. Mr. Baxter is sitting here reading a book, Ms. Dunbar glances at Baxter and then at you. That sounds suspicious. Um, so in the living room, um, we want to head east. And then we're going to go south. No. Did I screw this up? I don't think so. Mr. Baxter is in one corner talking to Ms. Dunbar. He notices you and motions Dunbar to stop talking. Um, I believe that I can wait here. Okay. And then Ms. Dunbar heads off to the east. So now I can follow her some more. Uh, Ms. Dunbar heads off to the south. Uh, Mrs. Rourke is walking past me, so let's follow Ms. Dunbar to the south. Ms. Um, yeah, we're still following Ms. Dunbar to the south. Ms. Dunbar spots you and stops. She reaches into her pocket and pulls out a cigarette. As she does, show, does so, what appears to be a ticket stub falls out of her pocket and floats to the ground. She checks her pocket again, apparently for a match, but finds none and puts the cigarette back into her pocket. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take that. Um, take the ticket stub. Oh no, the lab report slips from your arms while you're taking the ticket stub and both tumble to the ground. The lab report is now on the ground. Okay, ta take ticket stub and lab report. Okay, I got it. I don't know why, but you tend to have inventory problems right at that point. Um, but we got both now. Um, I believe what we want to do is show ticket. Let's, um, uh, let's examine ticket stub. Okay. Hartford Philharmonic Orchestra, July 7th, 1982, 8 p.m. Row R seat seven. This Dunbar stares off towards the south. We were told that Mr. Baxter went to the, the Hartford Philharmonic, but that he went by himself. If Ms. Dunbar has it, then we have them together on the night of the crime, and they denied it. There's some definite problems here. Show Stubb to Dunbar. I have some questions for you. Oh, well, I guess I should tell you. You see, Mr. Baxter and I, we go together to concerts, only occasionally, you understand. We went that night, the night Marshall died. Then he took me home, and that's it. I should have said something before, but I just didn't think it was important. And, well, I didn't think that the others should know we were seeing each other socially. Are, 
Nobody knows about it, you know? Please don't say anything. Ms. Dunbar eyes you nervously. She better be eyeing me nervously. This directly contradicts now two of the interviews that we had. So let's head north. And we want to go north again. And then west into the living room. Mr. Baxter is here. He's heading off to the east. How dare you? Um, I need to show that to him. So let's east. Heads off to the south. How dare you? South. East. Northeast. Where is he going? East. Northwest. We're just following. I'm not reading anything else. I'm just following Mr. Baxter here. North. No. Southeast. It said that he went here, right? Show stub to Baxter. There we go. He is still here. Good. Ah, uh, that must be Mrs. Ms. Dunbar's ticket stub. I should have told you earlier. Ms. Dunbar was with me at the concert on the night that Marshall killed himself. She became ill at intermission and hired a car to take her back home. You see, Inspector, I know that Ms. Dunbar appreciates classical music, so I occasionally ask her along to my subscription series. I really should have told the other detective, but I didn't think that it mattered. Baxter draws a deep breath and looks about contentedly. Yeah, no. We're going to go ahead and arrest both of them. And this should give us the best possible ending. That is the evidence that we need. He has lied to us several times. We have conflicting stories between him and Dunbar. Dunbar said that um, he that Baxter drove her home. Baxter is saying that she got a cab uh, home. So we definitely have different stories here. I'm confident that we have what we need. Let's arrest them both. Text of a letter from Police Commissioner Klutz, dated September 5th. Dear Inspector, congratulations on your superb handling of the Robner case. As you have probably heard, a jury convicted Mr. Baxter and Ms. Dunbar today of the murder of Mr. Robner. Thanks to you, the murderers will be, be, will be behind bars possibly for the rest of their lives. Thanks for a job brilliantly done, which reminds me of another fascinating case I would like to assign you to. Coming soon, another interlogic mystery from Infocom. You have solved the case. If you would like, you may see the author's summary of the story. We would advise you to come up with your own first. Would you like to see the author's summary? I absolutely would. Let's get the full details of what happened here, even though um, we can start putting the pieces together ourselves. It sounds to me that... Um, well, I mean, we have the ladder. Um, so it sounds to me that someone, uh, probably Mr. Baxter, um, did kill Marshall Robner. Um, that was his idea in order to get the business merger to happen, uh, because Robner was not happy about that. The will is kind of a, kind of a, a scapegoat here, a red herring, so to speak. It's just kind of out there and that does not actually solve our case. Um, we have the ebullion and the low blow together that caused the overdose. I believe that the low blow was in the um, second set of T, or sorry, the first set of T. So I believe that Dunbar went in and poisoned him and killed him. And Mr. Baxter uh, came up the ladder and switched the tea cups. Uh, so that they wouldn't show low blow in the one that we found. That is my story. Let's see what the author has to say. Mr. Robner's work was his life, as pointed out by a number of the principals. George knew that his father had lost control of the company, and a story in the newspaper indicated that Baxter indicated, intended to sell the company to a multinational conglomerate, presumably to advance his career. Baxter admitted to the merger plans, but indicated that Mr. Robner was in complete agreement. This is contrary to what George and Mrs. Robner said. The notepad found in the library was Robner's last desperate attempt to save the company, in which Robner threatened to expose Baxter's involvement in the Focus scandal. Baxter denied getting the note, but it was not in the trash. The papers detailing Baxter's criminality and the scandal were kept locked in a safe in a hidden closet near the library. 
only George and Marshall Robner knew the whereabouts of the safe. Baxter planned to murder his partner, aided by the fact that Robner was known to be depressed, even suicidal. He enlisted the help of his lover, Dunbar, one of whose medicines was found to interact fatally with the pills that Robner was taking. The relationship of B Baxter and Dunbar was kept quiet, although Mrs. Rourke had an inkling of it. After the concert in Hartford, which both Baxter and Dunbar attended, they returned to the Robner estate. Dunbar placed some low blow in Robner's tea. After Robner died, Baxter used the ladder from the shed to enter the library in exchange and exchange the incriminating cup for a clean one. Counting the china in the kitchen reveals a that a cup is missing. And then it went away. It wasn't easy, but I was able to find the rest of the author's summary. There's not much to it. I will just read the rest to you here. Remember we left off with counting the china in the kitchen reveals that a cup is missing. Coming down the ladder, Baxter presumably dropped the cup and inadvertently left one piece on the ground in the rose garden, near the ladder holes that McNabb found while tending his roses. And that is it. That is the author summary. So uh, we got what we would say is the best ending. There are multiple endings to this game. Uh, if you do not arrest Baxter and Dunbar in time, Baxter will presumably kill Dunbar. You have to actually make the arrest in order to get the best ending. You can't just put all the pieces together and then try to explore. You have to actually make that arrest. And I believe that when we were chasing Baxter around, that is what he was trying to do. So you do have to go out of your way to get that ending. Uh, that is the best possible ending. Like I said, there are multiple endings. If you want to, you can play the game for yourself and see all the different ones. Uh, we are not going to be going through and getting all the different endings for the game. So with the game now played, let's talk about how it holds up today. Playing the game today, I do have to say that I did enjoy it. I had fun playing Deadline. With that said, I did uh, not experience everything that the game has to offer. I didn't uh, get frustrated going down paths that led to nowhere. Um, I didn't miss anything by you know, waiting around for the right time to catch people in the act of doing certain things. Uh, so I knew those things were going to be coming so that I could get the best ending. So I didn't experience everything that the game has to offer. Um, but what I did play was enjoyable and I had fun playing it. Uh, the story is definitely one that is interesting, especially for video games at the time. I wouldn't say that the ending is the most original. It turned out to be his business partner and his lover, who also turned out to be the person that gave him the drink. Uh, that's not the most original storyline. That's not the most original ending. But it doesn't necessarily matter to me at the end because there was so much intrigue of all these other characters that could have done it and did have reasons more or less uh, to uh, to kill Mr. Robner. So ultimately, I think the story is strong, especially for video games at the time. But overall, I would say it was a good story regardless of the medium. It doesn't necessarily have to be just for video games that the story is good, the story is good. Um, with that said, of course, the uh, the game doesn't have any graphics, any sound, so I can't really rate those. Um, I would say that the controls of the game uh, did add more, but at the same time took away a little bit of my sense of control. Uh, when I was playing Zork, I felt like I was con in complete control. I always kind of knew what was happening and I could manipulate the character how I wanted. In this game, there were definitely some things that kind of gave me pause that I didn't necessarily know how to get my character to do certain things. And they're not always going to be as apparent as, you know, go north. Uh, there's tell this person this thing, wait for this person, randomly just analyze. Hey, if I say analyze, this person will just show up and take care of the analysis for me. And that's not something that's going to be all that obvious. Uh, there is documentation to help you with that, that went along with the casebook. Uh, but 
I don't necessarily know if it's intuitive and if you're in a situation, you're not necessarily going to think, wait, I can analyze this, right? There's not that kind of clue for you in there. Uh, in terms of the casebook, I do appreciate that the casebook was there. It gave us a sense of um, our situation when we got in. It was, this is where we are right now. Let's get you into it. Of course, if you look at it cynically, the only purpose of it was to try to prevent uh, copyright infringement by preventing people from making copies of the game and distributing it around. But it made complete sense in this game for you to have that documentation, for you to have a casebook when you show up with letters from, um, with a letter, I should say, from the lawyer, with interviews, with a coroner's report, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there were certain things that we were told that ended up leading to nothing, right? The the little bruise on Mr. Robner's head was just him falling from the chair. That was it. Uh, then um, George, of course, was a big red herring at the end of it. Just a big false... Um, uh, a big false lead, I guess you could say. Uh, all the stuff with George didn't end up panning out to him murdering him. Uh, but that's how I would say the casebook kind of led you from the start, was that it was George uh, that was your biggest suspect when you start the game after reading the casebook. So it's a lot of intrigue. It's interesting. Um, but the gameplay I felt was a little off simply because there were so, there were so many commands that were added that didn't necessarily function the way that I would like. In terms of replayability, I am somewhat interested in trying to get the different endings of the game. Um, so I might want to go back and kind of play the game to try to get those different endings. With that said though, I can't really find a whole lot of documentation on what the different endings are, let alone how to get them. So that's going to be, that would have to be something that I would spend a lot of time um, trying to figure out on my own. And that's not necessarily something that I would like to do is, is try to figure those out on my own. I would much rather kind of be guided along to be told all the different endings of the game. And as of right now, I don't have that kind of access. So the game is fun. Uh, it's not going to be something that I go back to simply because I, I know the ending and I can't get the other endings, the lesser endings, so to speak. Um, but if you are a fan of text adventures and you're willing to try to solve a mystery on your own and you don't mind already knowing the ending yourself uh, due to me getting it, uh, then this is definitely something that is worth checking out. Um and it can take you a lot of hours to try to get everything the way that you want. So um, it is definitely worth playing. And it is probably one that you haven't heard of, but it's worth checking out anyway. And that's my modern take on the game. When Deadline was released, it was received well. The critics praised the game's mystery, its depth, and its multiple endings. If there was a downside to the game, the ending was seen as disappointing. As time has gone on, the reviewers have remained positive, with the game occasionally being cited among the greatest video games of all time. Deadline would prove to be influential as well. The idea of having necessary information printed out on physical papers that would be given alongside the game would be something that would take over the industry. Not only did this allow for the game designers to expand upon their world in more depth than the limitations of programming would allow, this concept would help restrict the rampant piracy of the era. Computer game piracy was very simple at this time. The files on the disc could be copied easily, and then there would be two copies of the game that could easily be distributed. Having the physical paperwork, which would eventually be called feelies, would add another layer of protection against the distribution of computer games without any benefit to the developer or publisher. Deadline would be released for most computers at the time, including the Apple II, the Atari computers, the IBM PC, the TRS-80, as well as others that we have not seen yet. 
The game would not see any official sequel, but the idea of an interactive mystery would be one that would be seen again and again in the future. With another quality game released, Infocom would continue to be a big name in the computer game industry, still setting the standard for text-based adventures. We will hear from Infocom again. With Deadline, Mark Blank would prove that he could create a quality video game by himself. Blank would continue to work in the industry, and we will hear from him again. That will do it for the story of Deadline. My name is Baller Scuba. This has been Video Games Over Time. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in our next video when we take a look at a new computer.